Hello from Jonathan and from me, welcome to the program. First tonight, the MOD scientists who died carrying out top secret tests in Essex that were poorly planned and organised. Terry Jupp suffered severe burns in an explosion near Southend eight years ago and died a week later in hospital. Today, a jury at Southend Coroner's Court criticised the way those tests were carried out, saying that planning and risk assessment were inadequate. Well, Tom Barton's been at the inquest and joins us now. Tom, Mr Jupp's family have certainly had a long time to wait to hear the verdict on this one, haven't they? Yes, they have. The explosive tests that Terry Jupp was working on were highly classified. And that, along with a number of legal problems, mean it's taken eight long years for this inquest to be arranged. In fact, the eighth anniversary of Terry Jupp's death fell while the inquest was sitting and a minute's silence was held in court in his memory. Much of the evidence in this case was heard in secret behind closed doors. But today, in front of a packed courtroom, the jury delivered a verdict which is highly critical of Terry Jupp's employers. The remote and barren landscape of Shubley Ness firing range near South End was where MOD scientist Terry Jupp was fatally injured. Mr Jupp, who was from Hatfield in Hertfordshire, was working on secret explosives tests in August 2002. Tests which went badly wrong. An explosion left him with 60 to 90 percent burns, leading to his death six days later. We stayed with him all the time he was in the hospital and um, were there when he did actually um, have the need to uh, switch his life support off. So that was quite harrowing. Terry's not with us and that's a big hole in our whole family mm, life. It is. Today, at the end of an inquest held partly in secret because of the highly sensitive nature of Mr Jupp's work, a jury found the explosives tests were inappropriately planned and inadequately organised. Terry Jupp's widow has had to wait eight years for today's verdict and has been in court throughout his inquest. Due to the lengthy delay in the judicial system, we are now at the end of eight long and traumatic years for myself and my children. Questions that have been present throughout that time have finally been answered by listening to the wealth of evidence over the past four weeks. The threat of terror hanging over the UK since the attacks of September 11th was at the heart of Terry Jupp's work. He was part of an elite team of British and American scientists working to assess the explosive impact of homemade bombs used by terrorists. The team was working with three chemicals, referred to for security reasons only as A, B and C. The jury found that initial tests with smaller quantities of the chemicals should have been carried out and could have saved his life. Two officials from the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory were initially charged with manslaughter, but those charges were later dropped. However, the chief executive of DSTL today admitted failings in protecting Mr Jump. Some of the work that DSTL undertakes is, by its nature, extremely hazardous. And we do do everything we can to put in place the controls to manage those risks and hazards. Clearly, on this occasion, the measures we had in place at the time did not safeguard Terry Jupp in the manner in which we would have liked. Three years after Terry Jupp died, suicide bombers using homemade devices brought terror to London on July 7, 2005. However, his family say his work must have saved the lives of many others. Tonight, they're calling for official recognition of his contribution to national security. Next, the new generation of schools springing up across our region. A month ago, the new government passed the Academies Act, writing to every school in the country and inviting them to apply for academy status. Well, today, it announced 142 schools have been accepted, 15 of them in our region. Martin Stew spent the day at one school granted academy status two years ago under the Labour government, now with a new building and preparing for the start of the new school year. A new school year about to start and at the Open Academy in Norwich, a brand new school. I'm very excited. I never thought I'd be so excited to come back to school after a summer holiday. I, I actually wish the holidays were quite short than they actually are to come back. It's lots of new well, everything. We get new laptops, classrooms, facilities. It'll be interesting. 
Well, it's a real sign of investment in and belief in the community. It's, it's a £23 million project. It shows fully that people believe in this area and are committed to this area, and it will give the young people and community uh, of North East Norwich fantastic facilities. Just like the Thomas Deacon School in Peterborough, the Open Academy was purpose-built as part of the previous government's initiative. The 15 new academies in the east of England announced by the coalition today are existing high-performing schools like Northampton School for Boys. It's an attitude of mind really of taking responsibility for, for what we're doing. As far as the students are concerned it's going to be very much um, as it was before. The name is still the same, the buildings are still the same, the staff is still the same, so it's, uh, there are only a few things sort of behind the scenes that will change. So just what are academy schools and how do they differ from ordinary state schools? Well, first up, they're funded differently. Money comes straight from the government, bypassing local councils and giving the academies complete control over their budgets. Academies also have greater freedom to set their own curriculum and choose the exams they take, but they will still be held to account by regulators Ofcom. One area they won't differ is selection. Just like normal state schools, they won't have entrance exams. Advocates of the academies say they cut out bureaucracy and let schools decide how best to spend their money. But not everyone is convinced. There's no doubting the fantastic facilities at academies like this one, but critics say they're removing resources from other schools and creating a two-tier system. According to the National Union for Teachers, independent funding for academies will mean less money for local councils to support other schools in the area. It allows for proper coherent planning of, of local um, education provision which will be lost if, if each school is, is doing its own thing and ultimately that's, that's going to end up with children themselves not having a, a good local school. Not all academies are new builds. Some, like Thetford, will have to make do with existing buildings and possibly for some time given the state of government funding. But for students at the Open Academy, the start of the new term can't come soon enough. Martin Stew, Anglia News, Norwich. Things we went back to school today, maybe at one of the new academies. Yeah. Had a good first day back. Yeah, I hope it went well. Well, earlier I spoke to Anastasia Deval, Deputy Director of the Research Centre Civitas, and started by asking her how the academy system has changed under the new government. Well, under the new Labour government, academies were set up deliberately to serve deprived communities. This government, however, is seeing the academy as the model of school that will take over. So it's not just about deprived communities, it's about all communities. And we're also seeing outstanding schools across the board being asked to become academies and being able to become academies automatically. Well, we can also chuck free schools into the mix as well. Is it becoming confusing for parents, do you think? One of the issues at the moment is that there are, as it were, three parallel school systems, and that can be very confusing. There's the academy, there's the free school, and then there's the bog-standard comprehensive school. But it shouldn't be confusing if parents understand that actually academies and free schools will be very similar. The difference between these two types of schools and comprehensive schools is that they aren't run by the local authority and they have far greater freedoms, both in terms of how they spend their money and also what they spend their money on and how they teach. And if your child is going back to a, a bog standard secondary school, as you, as you describe it, will they feel that they're being left behind? Well, hopefully, and we know that a lot of standard, um, bog standard secondary schools are not actually bog standard at all. They're very good. There is an issue, though. One of the key concerns that's been expressed is that very good teachers might end up leaving the comprehensive school system and going into academies or free schools. The other system, um, the other problematic element of the system is that if freedoms are going to be good for schools, then what's going to happen to comprehensive schools? They aren't going to enjoy that innovation and that freedom, which actually is shown to be very beneficial and why the government is going for academies and free schools. So, yes, there is a potential liability that comprehensive schools are going to be left out in the cold, as it were. Let's hope not. Anastasia Duval, Deputy Director of the Research Centre, Sibitas, thank you very much indeed for your time this evening.